Would you guys stand and join us this morning? Good morning. It's not snowing. Praise the Lord. guys may be seated. Good morning and hear that we have the opportunity, if not already, children of God, right? Isn't that amazing? And I think it's extra special that today is Baptism Sunday. It's a day that we celebrate new life. And, uh, and I will just tell you up front that um, we love celebrating baptism around here because to celebrate that which was dead is now alive in Christ. And so I've uh, got a couple of things I want to just share with you. If you're a guest with us today, we want to say a special welcome to you. Uh, we're glad that you're here. We're glad you chose to worship with us this morning. And uh, if you would do me a favor, in the pew rack in front of you, there is a connection card. And that card is a really great opportunity to uh, get to know the church a little bit better and then for the church to know you a little bit better. And uh, so if you do me a favor, take that card out, fill the information out on the card. And then actually today is a unique Sunday because it is meet and greet Sunday. So following the service, if you walk right out these doors here in the back and turn right, there is a cafe called the Connect Cafe. And we would love to meet with you there for just a few minutes. And we're just going to help you to understand the vision of the church and the mission and who we are. Our mission around here is reaching people to equip people to reach people. 
And uh, you may have noticed over the past few months that we have not been pointing to our banners um, because they have not been there. Uh, after Christmas, uh, I said, don't put up the old banners because we want to update them. And really, to be honest with you, the reason for the update is to make it even easier to grasp our vision. So our vision is praying deeper to reach wider. And that's in five years, we want to launch five church-type missions. We launched the first one in January of 2019 of this year, and uh, we are looking to launch additional ministries in the next coming years. But if you look up here at these banners, they have new language on them. They're actually, there's action associated with our core values. The core values of worship and prayer, connect, grow, serve, and go is taken directly from Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. Now with that, also we have this additional language that I think is going to really be beneficial for us. So under worship and prayer, the point of that core value is to gather together. It's what we do on Sundays. It's this. It's being together. It's not just for the sense of just worshiping or gathering. It's in the sense that every time that we gather, we gather as the body of Christ. And so um, we gather together under the core value of worship and prayer. Prayer is, again, another one of the most important things that we do. Uh, we offer multiple opportunities to pray during the week, one of those being Tuesday mornings for men's prayer at 6.30, Wednesday nights for prayer uh, at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary, and then we also pray before the service at 9.30 in our prayer room, which is actually uh, just located down the hall over here as you walk into the building. So prayer is a vital piece. It's, like I said, it's even the core of our vision of reaching, uh, of praying deeper in order to reach wider. And then under Connect, we have Build Relationships. So one of the things that I preface around here all the time is that we understand that people are going to belong before they believe. And, and it used to be back in the life of the church that it was you had to believe before you joined the club, right? And, and the truth is that's, that's not the way that, that Christ has designed the church. It's a place that we believe that people will belong first, that you will come and, and be encouraged and connect and just have that sense of belonging. And we trust the Holy Spirit that through the Holy Spirit and through that sense of belonging that you will get to the place where you will believe and we're gonna be there to walk with you on that journey. So for us, connecting is, is important. It's about building those relationships and we do that through things like life groups um, which happen throughout the week and other discussion groups as well. Under GROW, uh, we have follow Jesus. And again, this helps to point to the fact that you would think that follow Jesus would be over here, but the reality is that we believe, again, through that belonging, that you will follow Jesus and grow um, as you continue to grow in that relationship with him. And then serving. Now, here's a really fun thing I get to share with you. Next Sunday is Volunteer Sunday. We have already started to make plans to acknowledge everybody who has volunteered over this past year. The great thing is um, we recognize that we actually have to have a lot of things in order to recognize all that have volunteered. So if you've served in a ministry this past year, if you've gone to Hesed House, if, you've, if you have uh, done tech ministry, or if you have been in the video broadcast room, which people don't even realize that we have a whole room that's dedicated to broadcasting, and there is a person that sits in there every single Sunday and makes sure that what you see online when you're not here happens. It doesn't just happen by accident. It's a person that literally does that, and there's a rotation of people that do that. And so we are excited that Volunteer Sunday is going to be filled with, with being able to acknowledge you and thank you for all of your service over this past year. We, we talk about the, the typical churches have the 20-80 rule. You have 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. And for us, it's actually reversed. We have probably 80% of the people, if not even more than that, that are doing, well, 100% of the work, you know? So it's not that we're doing less work. We're doing the same amount of work but it's everybody pulling together, and so we're going to celebrate that next week. We're also going to celebrate that next week is Cinco de Mayo, How, the, I, my, one of my, my favorite times of year. 
Cinco de Mayo is next week, our Mexican independence celebration. And so we are going to have Mexican food Sunday in the, in the gym following the service. So we want you to bring your favorite Mexican dishes. And, um, and if you need help with that, you can see Ruby or, or CJ or JC Ravellis. They, they have, I almost called you CJ. I don't have, I don't even <laughs> And JC, um, and, uh, and I brag on them all the time because uh, they make some incredible, incredible Mexican dishes. And so that's next Sunday, following the service, we're going to celebrate Cinco de Mayo together, uh, which is going to be awesome. So, and then, um, where am I at? So, yeah, so under serve, it's lend a hand. Find a place to get plugged in. And there's so many different areas and avenues that you can find a place to be able to connect into the, into the church. And then our last banner, which is actually behind you, is our Go banner. And uh, as I was hanging that banner, banner yesterday, and thank you to Daniel Kwok and Dan Coughlin, um, who helped me because it's really high. And, and, I, and they definitely noticed that my comfort level started to get a little bit better as I did more. But the first one, which was over here, it was touch and go for a while. So the bring a friend, go. It's in the back because it's a reminder. It's, the, it's our play like a champion today banner, right? As you go out, jump up and touch it, right? It's, it's we're going out into the mission field. We're, 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 we're heading out into, into living out our lives for Christ in the world around us and to be transformation agents in the world. And so uh, our go banner is in the back. Well, just a couple of real quick things for you. Um, uh, coming up on May 19th, it's a big Sunday. Uh, we're doing a couple of different things. One is it's, it's our 90-10 Sunday. It's our Power of One Sunday. It's the opportunity for us to raise um, necessary funds for us to support our mission efforts. It's Acts 1-8. We're going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and ends of the earth. Our goal is to raise $48,000 on that Sunday so that we can operate out of what we have versus what we, um, what we need. And and if we do that, so the goal with 9010 Sunday is for you to bring 90% of one week's worth of your salary. So you take your salary, your household income for the entire year, you divide that by 52, whatever that number is, you then uh, bring 90% of that on that Sunday. We wanted to give you a heads up so you can plan and budget and prepare. And uh, the goal, if, you know, if everybody does that, we will raise our funds and we'll be able to fund all of these incredible ministries that we've been highlighting over the last couple of months. So May 19th is a really important Sunday. It's also an important Sunday because it's Election Sunday. So we will be electing our new board on May 19th. Next week, you'll start to see information about um, bio sheets and information regarding who's going to be on the ballot for the church board. And uh, so that is all going to be coming up here in the next couple of weeks. So make sure you mark your calendar. Calendars. And then uh, the last thing is today we have our primetime luncheon. Um, it, that is open to anybody that would like to attend, um, especially those who would uh, consider yourself um, a prime timer. We will not be uh, considering you a prime timer, but if you consider yourself a prime timer, then you would qualify to be a part of uh, that awesome ministry. So that'll be happening uh, this afternoon. Well, again, this morning is. Uh, baptism Sunday, and we're going to pray and we're going to receive the offering this morning. And again, as a guest this morning, that we only anticipate you placing that connection card in the plate as it comes by. And uh, would you pray with me as we begin? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your hand that is upon us, that uh, you are moving in power. That, Lord, uh, through Baptism Sunday and through the testimony this morning, uh, um, Alex's testimony, that your spirit would move in just incredible power. And we thank you. We give you praise for this in your name. Amen. Alex to come. Alex, 
is going to share this morning. And the, the amazing thing, Alex is going to be baptized today. And uh, Alex's wife, Monique, is actually going to read Alex's testimony. Now, we've actually have tried to plan this a couple of different times. He wanted to surprise his family with being baptized. And uh, we, we figured she was on to it. She knew. Um, and so uh, Monique is going to read Alex's testimony this morning. So Monique, please share. All right. Good morning, everyone. Hello, my name is Alex Arevalo. I came to the United States from Honduras in Central America when I was 19 years old. I came to the land of opportunity, full of dreams and hopes for a better future. Things were not always easy. I experienced discrimination, rejection, hardship, and loneliness. Things got complicated at times. I thought I was on my own and had to do things the best I could to survive. The hard life I had when growing <coughs> up had me believe that I was all alone in this world. I didn't think God knew I existed. I didn't think God cared about poor, broken people like myself. God had started talking to me not once or twice, but several times. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to listen. I had not time I had no time for God or church because I had to provide for my family. I didn't know God had been watching over me and providing for my needs. Then I had to go to then I had to go back to Honduras to obtain my legal status in this country. And it was there that I felt the love and prayers from the whole church. I never realized how many people were united thinking, praying and sending their love for me. I want to thank and show my appreciation to some special and dear people that have been such an encouragement and support in my spiritual journey, such as Paul Sloan, Dan and Mary Coughlin, and Jackie Justo, and of course, my wife and mother-in-law. God opened my eyes and showed me everything he had done for me. He gave me a family of my own and many other beautiful things I never dreamed about. I was able to see how abundantly he had been blessing me all along. I am so thankful for the most importantly, I want to have a close relationship with God, the God that loved me first. Just this past Monday, I woke up shivering. A question came into my mind, how long am I going to wait to declare that Jesus is my Lord and Savior? So here I am. I'm just Jesus, I'm yours. Thank you. <laughs> hey, hey, don't go anywhere yet. Don't go anywhere yet. You got to take in this moment. I want you to know, I, I'm just going to, I'm going to brag on, on Alex for a second. You may be seated. Um, and actually, I'm going to brag on a couple of different people this morning. You know, Alex works with Jackie Justo at uh, the Melting Pot, and, um, and through their relationship and uh, Jackie persistently inviting Alex and, and his family uh, to come, they came to the Easter egg hunt last year. Uh, we'll talk about an incredibly powerful moment when Monique shared in the Easter egg hunt this year, she got to look out at a crowd of people and say to them, I was where you were sitting last year. That was their introduction to Trinity when they came in. In fact, uh, Anna, the, the, um, Alex's mother-in-law, Monique's mom, uh, came to that Easter egg hunt and said, I love this church. She said, I don't know anything about this church, but I just love it. And, uh, and she was baptized very quickly after that. I believe it was the baptism Sunday after the Easter egg hunt last year. And Anna had prayed and prayed and prayed as a, as a faithful mother and mother-in-law for her family. And Anna, I want you to look. I want you to look at the fruit of your prayer and the fact that you were dedicated to praying. 
And both Alex and Monique are finding ways that they are serving God, and, and it's just amazing. And, uh, and Alex has been uh, such an encouragement to me. Every time I see him, he's always faithful to give me a hug, and, 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 uh, and we, just, I, we just love you. And we're so glad that, uh, that you have made this decision today. And I just have a couple of things to, to go through so that we understand the meaning and the power of this moment. So baptism is the sign and the seal of the new covenant of grace the significance of which is attested by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and through 5, it says, Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, that we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ in baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the, dead, from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives." Since we have been united with him in his death, we also will be raised to life as he, as he was. The earliest and the simplest statement of Christian belief into which we now come to be baptized is the Apostles' Creed. And the Apostles' Creed reads as follows, I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church of Jesus Christ, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Alex, will you be baptized into this faith? If so, answer, I will. Do you acknowledge that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, and do you realize that He saves you now? If so, answer, I do. And will you obey God's holy will and keep His commandments, walking in them all the days of your life? If so, answer, I will. Awesome. Can we show Alex our thanks and appreciation? Okay. Would you guys stand and join us in celebration?
sing this with me, no matter what I've done. And no matter what.
um, as we go into this time of prayer, I want to invite you to take whatever posture um, you feel like. If you want to sit, you can sit. If you want to stand, you can stand. Um, even if you want to go to the altars, the altars are open. Um, this week, I kept thinking about uh, the song that I heard that talked about um, about how easy God is to find. Um, how we could, it talked about how um, you could search on the mountains or you could search in the valleys or you can search in the water, um, in the oceans, um, but God's so easy to find. Um, and so if you need to, whatever you need to talk to God about this morning, I pray that you would take this time um, just to spend with him. I, I love that we did it with uh, Alex's testimony of just, um, just how good God is and how effective prayer is uh, when we believe that um, God will do what he says he's going to do. So let's, let's pray. God, you're so good to us. And I pray that whatever's going on in each one of our lives, God, that you would, um, you would be meeting with each person, um, that you would be multitasking in this room um, and whatever needs to be happening, God, that um, we, our hearts would be open to that um, and be opening to you. I praise you so much for the ways that you work and in, in, that you have worked in Alex's life and, um, and in my life and in um, just the lives of the people in this room and the lives in the, of the people that are in the, um, the, out in the world. I thank you so much for the ways that you work in uh, St. John's Episcopal Church and um, the West Chicago Church of the Nazarene and even through missionaries like uh, Dwight and Carol Rich who are um, proclaiming your word, God. I pray that you would continue to... Um, to, to give us boldness uh, when we proclaim what you've done. And I, I pray that you would continue to surprise us with the good things that you do for us and the good things that um, you have for us. pray that you would uh, continue to protect us um, and uh, you would meet us in the valleys and you would meet us in, um, that you would meet us on the, on the hilltops um, when, when you do good things. I pray that we wouldn't forget the moments that you just are so real to us, and I pray that those moments would continue to happen. And as Pastor Steve comes and proclaims your word, God, I pray that you would continue to do the work that you're doing this morning. Uh, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, my experience with baptism goes all the way back to when I was a child. And I always uh, loved water. And water and I, we were best friends. And we had a pool growing up, and so there was, it was often we would find ourselves out there. Even when the pool was closed, we would try to figure out ways to get into the pool. And uh, this was kind of dangerous at times as well. I can remember actually one time in the winter falling through the ice that collects on the top of the pool cover. And uh, I actually don't think my parents know that story. So, um, sorry, Mom and Dad. <laughs> <laughs> and my kids were the same. My kids are the same. They love water. In fact, I was watching a video a few weeks ago um, of Peyton when she was little, little, and we were in Florida, and uh, we had gone to this restaurant that was right on the beach, and the goal was to make sure that we were going to eat first, because we knew if we went to the beach that Peyton would get soaking wet, and then she would be soaking wet to eat. So we had this all planned out. And uh, so we ate dinner, and then we went out onto the beach, and um, Parker was just, he was real little, uh, but the two of them played out in the sand, and then sure enough, it was only a matter of time. Um, in fact, uh, my, my in-laws are here, my father-in-law, you can hear him on the video say, here she goes. And so sure enough, she would start walking to the water, and it was like, you know, at first it was kind of feel the water, and then it was, oh, water's fine. And then she would just jump right in. And so all of a sudden now we're We've got a soaking, you know, probably she was maybe five, six, something like, yeah, around there. Three, yeah. So, I mean, when you go, when you go into the, to those parks that had the water features, you know, it was just guaranteed that my children were going to get soaking wet. So we just let it happen, you know. I mean, what are you going to do? So they would run through the water park and the water feature, and if there was a fountain, the fountain was now a pool, if, you know, you name it. So for me and myself, even my own experience with water, um, I had even in college a, a class project of ours. We actually did 
a baptism service from start to finish. And we had a, uh, one of my friends, Nate Stoltz, who's a pastor, um, uh, actually um, in a church, I'm trying to remember where he's from, uh, it's Ohio actually. He um, was baptized for the first time by us. Like I was the minister and then uh, other students in the class actually helped to participate. And it was all over saw by an ordained elder in the church. So it, I mean, his baptism stuck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in fact, he reached out to me just a few weeks ago and said, and said, hey, do you remember that? And I said, yeah, I remember that. And he goes, I just found that video. He's like, literally, my parents drove down from Michigan and we watched it and they actually recorded it on VHS. He's like, I have the VHS video of that moment. I'm like, man, that is, that is really incredible. He goes, yeah, it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, but I wouldn't trade that experience because that was a part of my baptism story. He said, I wouldn't trade that. And uh, in fact, I want to show you a little glimpse of my baptism story. So this is me being baptized. And I used to call it Buckingham Fountain. Um, it's actually called Buckingham Pool, and it's on this very south uh, side of Kankakee, and um, it, we were having a, a baptism service. Now, at this point, when you see this picture, I am a full-time youth pastor, and um, I had never been baptized. I, I grew up in the church. I remember the conversation with my mom, and I said, hey, when was my baptism? She's like, baptism? She's like, you were dedicated, uh, but baptism is your choice. And I'm like, well, when were you going to let me know? And I remember growing up, and they would have baptism services, and my parents were never pushy about those types of things. And, and so they, we had baptism services, and I was like, oh, no, I've already been baptized. And I had this idea in my mind, I had already been baptized, so I just never had done it. And then all of a sudden, I was in college. We were going through this course about um, the sacraments, and all, we started talking about baptism, and, and they were asking, people were talking about when they were baptized and everything. And I was like, oh, yeah, I was baptized when I was little. And I just confirmed that, and that's when we, my mom and I had this conversation. So I actually was supposed to be baptized in the Jordan River in Israel my junior year in college. It was a trip that we were taking, and unfortunately the trip got canceled because of a lot of civil unrest in Israel at the time. Uh, but from what I understand, I mean, to be baptized in the Jordan River would be an incredible experience, um, although it is incredibly dirty, so the Jordan River in Israel is filthy, um, but they do it, it's like conveyor style. I mean, they, they put white robes and people walk down, and there's literally thousands of people every day that are baptized in the Jordan River, which I thought, man, that is amazing. In fact, we're going to look at a story of thousands of people that were baptized in the Jordan River today, because every once in a while, I think it's really important that we, we fully understand and we learn and know what is baptism all about. 27 years old, had never been baptized, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a pastor in a church, and I'm teaching my kids about baptism, and I'm telling my students they need to be baptized, and I myself was not baptized. And so this moment that you see here was incredibly powerful, and it was powerful for a couple of reasons. It was the culmination of, of my relationship with Christ. And again, I'm going to talk a little bit about that that um, here coming up, but the other thing that's really powerful about this image is the, is the other person who's in it, and uh, Pastor Heck, um, who was one of my mentors, and um, he has gone on to be with the Lord. He passed away of cancer a few years ago, um, but I, I just remember the excitement that he had for that moment. I mean, I, when, when you all are baptized, and I get to be the person who baptizes you I'm a name that you'll never forget. You might want to at times forget my name, but, but I'm a name you won't forget because people will ask you, well, who, who baptized you, right? And Alex will say, my pastor, Pastor Steve baptized me. And in those moments when I'm, when I'm able to take you down into the water and bring you back out of the water, it's such a powerful moment, not just for you, but for me because I'm the closest person in that moment to celebrate this new life this resurrected life. And, uh, and so when you come out of the water and you put your hands in the air, just like Alex did today, that's such an exciting moment for me as well. And, uh, and there's times where I, I just don't want to leave. I don't, 
And to be honest with you, every time we do a baptism service, pretty much almost every time, after the service is over, I'll have somebody come up and they'll say, hey, I want to be baptized next time. And my response is typically, water's great, <laughs> just come on in, right? It's there, the water's there, it's 94 degrees, it's beautiful, and you can be baptized. And so to be honest with you, I don't know how this service is going to end, I really don't. But I think that this service can end kind of like one of those books, you know, you choose the ending. Because what we're going to do at the end of this service is we're going to give you an opportunity that if you want to be baptized this morning, <laughs> it's right here. I will gladly put on wet clothes and go back in there and baptize every person in this room that says, I, I want to wear the, the, the wedding ring of Christ on my finger through baptism. I want that 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 public declaration of saying, God, just like Alex said in his testimony, here I am. I am all yours in that moment. There's going to be no pressure. I'm just saying that up front to you. The reason I say I don't know how the service is going to end, we're going to, we're going to have a song. In fact, to be honest with you, um, um, we're, we'll, we have a song that's planned, which we'll do, but then if it goes longer, we're just going to do covered again. Is that not an amazing song for baptism? Talking about being covered by the grace of God. I mean, that ultimately, that's what baptism is all about. It's being recovered. In fact, in Galatians, it actually speaks to that. In Galatians chapter 3, it says, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ. Have put on Christ. Christ. I know that scripture is somewhere in my message. So Galatians chapter 3, and it says that have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. Like putting on new clothes. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes clothes. You know, the amazing thing is, the, is the, the next time that we all put on new clothes together will be at the resurrection when Christ comes and returns, and we will all put on the new resurrected clothes. But this is our earthly opportunity to put on these new garments of faith and say, I want to be covered by Christ. I want to be covered by in Christ. It's the opportunity of proclaiming publicly, he's mine and I'm his. And, and you know what? I, I always love this. Um, when I was in high school, it was at NYC and uh, 1995 in Phoenix. Woo anyway, so it was NYC and Reggie Dabbs was the preacher and he talked about drip dry, drip dry. And, uh, and so all of a sudden, he talks about the baptism that we experience, not just the physical baptism, but also the baptism we experience in Christ and being a new creation. And he said, when you come out of the water, now, now Reggie Dabbs is a, is a really big black guy. And so he, he can preach, right? Because, I mean, apparently all large black men can preach. I, and I just wish I had like a tenth of the soul. But he talked about when you get out of the water, he said, you drip. He says, well, you drip. You drip on everyone. You drip everywhere, and you drip on everything. And he says, so don't dry off. Drip dry. Drip dry. He's like, you need to walk around, and people need to know that you've been baptized by Christ. People need to know that you have put on that wedding ring of baptism, that you've walked down the aisle and made that public declaration. He said, they need to know that you're going to drip all over them. He says, when you go to work, you drip on them. When you go to school, drip on them. Drip all over them. He said, when you're sitting with your family, drip on them. He said, they don't even know they're being dripped on. Just keep dripping on them. He said, because as you keep dripping on them, guess what? They're going to get wet. And he goes, when they get wet, they're going to get wet enough that they too are going to walk down that aisle of faith. They're going to put on that ring of baptism and say publicly, he is mine and I am his. Right? Come on, Holy Spirit is preaching now. <laughs> it's true. It's true. We would look in, in fact, I'm going to invite you just to turn in your, in your, in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. We're going to just take a quick look at this. I, I'm not going to preach long to be, well, I, I say that. I say, 
I say that, but my goal is not to preach that long. Acts chapter 2, um, if you're in your, in your pew Bibles, the red Bible, it's going to be on page 981. On the yellow Bible, it's going to be on page 831. And again, I, I want to always make sure I say this, those Bibles are gifts. So if you need a Bible this morning, take that Bible with you. We will replace it with another one. And the person who sits there next week, we pray, will take another Bible. So that's our goal. So in Acts chapter 2, this incredible moment and powerful moment is happening for the disciples that are now apostles. The difference between a disciple and apostle is disciple is taught and apostle is teaching. That, that's, the, that's the only difference. People ask that all the time. What's the difference between a disciple and apostle? A disciple is learning and an apostle is, is doing. They're teaching. So now the apostles and, and Peter find this incredible moment when at Pentecost, tongues of fire, looks like tongues of fire come resting on them. It's the power and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so they seize the opportunity that they start preaching and they, are, and they start preaching in languages that everybody that can hear them can all hear them in their own native tongue. This is powerful. And if you remember last week, uh, Easter Sunday, I talked about the, the, the format of Peter's message. It's the same here in Acts 2 as it was when we looked at it last week in uh, the other chapter of Acts. But it's, it's literally, he talks about the gospel of what happened to Jesus. He said, you killed him, God raised him, we saw him, now say you're sorry. That's what it was. You killed him, God raised him, we saw him. Now say you're sorry. So that's the message that he preaches to them. In fact, if we look here at, uh, in verse 16, he's talking, he, he, there's a lot of people that go, what is wrong with these guys? Or what are they, drunk? And literally Peter has to explain to them, they are drunk, but they are drunk in the spirit, right? But they're not, he says, no, they're not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. He says, but this is what he says. No, what you see was pre- was pre- predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. Now, here's the amazing thing. Peter is about to, to communicate with them in terms, language, and understanding that they know and understand. The, the New Testament is being written right before their eyes, but the Old Testament had been around for thousands of years. So they have the, the, the Old Testament understanding. They would have known that he's about to quote from the prophet Joel. And what he says here is so important to the future of the church. Not just the immediate future of what they were experiencing there, but the future, our future, who we are as a people, what we're leaning towards, the, the, the already but not yet future before us. It is so important what he's about to say. And the amazing thing was it was, it was predicted hundreds of years before that very moment when Peter is standing before them. He's like, hey, listen, why are you surprised? Joel, the prophet, said that this would happen. So verse 17, in the last days, which again, they believed that they were living in the last days. Just the intensity by which they lived, they lived by this model that they are living in the last days, and we need to live with the same intensity. We cannot fall asleep because when we fall asleep, that's when we start to think, oh, well, you know, he hasn't come back in thousands of years, so maybe he's not going to come back for a thousand years more. Nobody knows the hour or the day. Nobody. Not even the Son of Man. Well, now he does. Then he didn't. But he says, nobody knows the hour or the day. So we need to live with this anticipation. So they were living with this anticipation. He says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Stop there. By the way, when people ask where we get our theology of ordaining women in the church of the Nazarene, it would be easy for us to say, well, they just made it up in the New Testament. No, it's foundational right here in Joel chapter 2, verse 2, that not only do men get the opportunity to be filled by the Holy Spirit and to prophesy, but women also get filled by the Holy Spirit and they too prophesy. Just saying. He says, your sons, your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants. 
men and women alike, and they will prophesy, and I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds and smoke. The sun will become dark. The moon will turn blood red before that great day, great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved." Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Don't make salvation harder than it needs to be. It's about calling on the name of the Lord. When you call on the name of the Lord, he will begin to dig into you. And he will begin to clean and clear out those parts that you go, I don't know, God, I'm pretty dirty. But he will, get, he will clean that. He will purify you like this beautiful, dirty gold brick that goes into the oven. And that fire gets hot enough to, to singe the impurities around that gold brick. So when it is taken out of the fire, it is gorgeous. It is purified. It is righteous. And that is what we're talking about here. Those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Call on the name of the Lord. He then goes into detail to talk about David. And the reason he talks about David is because for everybody who's standing there and they're listening to this and they're hearing this, they're, they're experiencing this in real time. They're going, oh, wait, 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 we know David. We know David. Tell us more about David. What is it about David? So all of a sudden he says in verse 36, so let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Man, that's such a great question. It's such a great question. The, the question is, I am hearing what you're saying. Now I feel compelled to ask, what do I do with this? Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Remember, we talked about it last week. Repentance. It's more about who you're turning towards than what you're turning from. That's what repentance is. Don't make it harder than it needs to be. Repentance, true repentance, is turning away, but it's who you're turning to, the author and the perfecter of your faith, versus wallowing in all the mess and the stuff. He says, you must repent, turn, uh, yeah, of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is to you, to your children, and to those even far away. All who have been called by the Lord are God. Yeah, you know what, Alex, you know what I think about when I just read that, when it says, even those who are far away, I think about your family right now that's watching in Honduras. That it's for you too. It's for you too. No matter where you're watching right now online, just because we're all sitting in here talking about this doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit isn't speaking in those places right now. He says, Then promises to you, to your children, to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time because <laughs> he's a preacher, struggling. Uh, strongly, sorry, strongly urging all of his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. 3,000. I love the fact that it's that Luke includes the word about. Like, it's a rough number. I think this is like the first example that you see pastoral counting, Right? Like, so pastorally speaking, there's like 500 people right now in the congregation, just pastorally speaking, right? And they're like, oh, it was about 3,000. Well, truth be told, they wouldn't have included the women and the children. That number would only include just the men. But we know that, pro that women and children were baptized as well. So it would have been more than 3,000. Now, I want you to picture that scene. Picture the power of that moment. Peter stands up. He has this opportunity to present the gospel, to preach it, the power for what it is, that you don't have the ability on your own self to make yourself clean. If you did, if you had the ability to clean yourself, you wouldn't need Jesus. He says, you don't have the ability under your own strength to clean yourself. That is why we need Jesus. And he preaches this powerful message, and people go, 
their hearts are quickened and they're just cut to the heart and they go, what must I do with this information? And all of a sudden, Peter says, you need to repent. You need to be baptized. And, and this, this incredible thing is that 3,000 people just stood in line. They just stood in line and they waited to be baptized. Do you think that anybody, when they were standing in line, all of a sudden they go, hey, I don't, you know, guys, it's, it's getting kind of late. I don't know about all this. Like, you know, maybe they paid like uh, the new Avengers movie. People are paying to have their seats saved. You know, they have seat savers, right? Maybe they had seat savers. Hey, I'll give you 15 shekels if you just stand in line for me, right? Just, just hold my place. And then they go and they do their stuff and they come back. No, they stood in line. How long did it take for 3,000 people to be baptized? I don't know, but I know it was a long time. You don't just move through 3,000 people that quickly, and they all stood in line. And why? It's not, it's because they, they wanted to. It wasn't because they have to. They didn't have to stand in line. But they wanted to. They said, I, I want to wait. I want to experience this. Jesus, who was sinless perfection, was baptized by John. Why? He didn't have to. Jesus didn't have to be baptized. So why was Jesus baptized? It wasn't because he had to. It's because he wanted to. It's because he wanted to. He wanted to say, if I'm going to ask you to walk down that aisle, for you to put on that ring of baptism, for you to declare that God is yours and you are his, if I'm going to call you to that, then I'm going to show you what it looks like. Because again, that's the way Jesus works. Jesus will always show you what he wants you to do even before he asks you to do it. So all of a sudden, we have this exciting moment. And this story is so full of meaning. And the meaning that we actually see here is the, is the progression I want you to know about baptism. There is a progression. I don't want to get this out of order. The progression is this, repent, believe, and be baptized. Repent, believe, and be baptized. We don't, we don't want to get this out of order because this is, this is important. I really believe, I really believe that there are many in this place, there are many even w within the sound of my voice or can watch online right now that have repented and that have believed but potentially haven't taken that last step of being baptized. Now, listen, I'm not mad at you. I really want you to hear this. God ain't mad at you either. Because you need to hear me say this this morning. Now, this isn't a, you know, get you off the hook type of moment because that's not what the, the intention of this message is. Baptism is not a prerequisite for heaven. Baptism is not a prerequisite for heaven. And, and the reason why we know that is because grace is the prerequisite for heaven. Salvation in Christ and Christ alone is the prerequisite of heaven. Baptism is what we get to do. Baptism is the celebration of saying, I believe in that powerful moment that I have been filled, covered by God's grace. And so now, what do I get to do? I get to say, okay, God, I'm all in. I'm all in. So it's exciting. And it's amazing because when we look at this story in, in, in Acts chapter 8, I'm going I'm to cut this down because just for time sensitivity. In Acts chapter 8, we find Philip, the apostle, who is led by the Holy Spirit to an Ethiopian eunuch. Now, let me just tell you, if there is a person who doesn't deserve the grace of God in, in, in by everybody else's standards, it's an Ethiopian eunuch. But the Holy Spirit comes to Philip and says, hey, I want you to go to this chariot and I want you to share the gospel. And so Philip is like, okay. He catches up with this chariot. As he's approaching the chariot, he hears the Ethiopian eunuch reading and he goes, wait a minute, I know that, I know that book. I know those verses. The Ethiopian eunuch is reading from Isaiah 53. Now listen, if you're going to pick up the Bible and you're just going to start randomly reading somewhere and you land on Isaiah 53 where it talks about the suffering servant, 
where it talks about the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world, when, you talk, when, it, when it talks about the, these, this incredible moment where it foreshadows to Jesus, that's a powerful, powerful moment. And Philip goes, hey, what are you reading? <laughs> and literally, the Ethiopian eunuch's like, listen, I really don't know. But why is he reading that? You better believe that the reason he's reading that is because word is traveling about what the apostles are preaching about. They, they're, they're gaining more power. They're seeing miracles happen. The man that was, that was lame outside the temple gate, beautiful, now all of a sudden is walking around and he becomes like their chief evangelist. He's going around, he's like, hey, you remember me? <laughs> right? And they're all freaking out. They're like, weren't you the guy that's been lame for over 40 years? Yeah, that was me. How is this possible? Let me tell you, his name's Jesus. So word starts to travel. So this Ethiopian eunuch is going, even me? Even me? Maybe he was in the crowd and he heard Peter say, even your servants will be filled with the Holy Spirit and will prophesy. Because that's what he was. He was basically the equivalent of a servant. He worked under, under the leadership of Candace. And so all of a sudden you have this, this, this powerful moment and Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch's like, how can I? He's like, I can barely read this, let alone understand it. So what does Philip do? He teaches him right there. Starting with that scripture, he points him to Jesus. Now here's the amazing thing. In some way, some form, in some fashion, all of Scripture points to Jesus. Even if you go to the Old Testament, you start in the Old Testament, it is a foreshadowing of Jesus. And what's even more amazing is how many people missed it even when he was standing right in front of them. And they missed it. So the eunuch, we're going to look here at verse 35 in chapter 8, verse 35 of Acts. So beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. Now I want you to look at the eunuch's response, verse 36. As they rode along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? <laughs> why can't, why not me? Why not here? Why not right now? So, I mean, so, so the, the interesting thing is it's somewhere along the line, as Philip is explaining what happens through this incredible moment and power of salvation, he also gets to this point where he talks about baptism. And it's a step in the process and response. He says, look, there's some water. Why, why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. 27 different times in the book of Acts, we find people Number one, believing, and number two, being baptized. 27 different times, just in the book of Acts alone, we find stories of this transformation and baptism. And I want you to understand, baptism is not a denominational thing. It's not a denominational thing. And it's not even a church thing. When you're baptized, you're not baptized into a church. You're baptized into the kingdom. You're baptized into the kingdom. The kingdom of God is forcefully advancing, and you're baptized into that kingdom. I want you to think of it this way, and I've been saying this this morning. Baptism is like the wedding ring of the Christian faith. It's like the wedding ring of your Christian faith. You're saying, I'm taken. I'm married to God, and I'm not, I'm not afraid to walk down that aisle. I'm not afraid not only to walk down the aisle, I'm, I'm not afraid to walk into the water and to be joined with him through baptism. I want you to think of the power of the moment when, when and, I, and it really dawned on me, maybe because I knew what I was going to be preaching on this morning, but I asked Alex, you know, will you be baptized into this faith today? And he said, uh, what well, was the question I asked when he said, I do. I do. Right? In those moments, the covenant of, of marriage is so strong. It's not just the marriage of of a man and a woman in the ceremony, but it's also the marriage and the covenant that we make with God in the, in the moment of baptism. The symbolism and the power of that unity. We've already read Romans 6, verses 3 through 5, but I'll read it again. Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ in baptism, we joined him in his death? 
For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. I'm going to invite the band to come back up. And uh, they're going to just be prepared for us to just respond in song. Again, I want to make sure you hear me tell you this morning that there is absolutely zero pressure. I, I don't want a moment like this. Some of you, I really believe some of you are potentially just, you're struggling. You're struggling to go, um, man, I think I, think, I think I want to be baptized this morning. You know, yeah. So here, here's, here's the deal. I want you to hear me. Baptism is not about salvation. It's about identification. It's not about salvation. It's about identification. Baptism isn't about salvation. It's about consecration. These are the things that baptism is about. Identification, consecration, being set apart saying, I want to I be covered by Christ. I want to experience liquid grace. That's what baptism is, liquid grace. I just made that up. I don't even know if that works. Does that work, Pastor Katie? She'll tell me later. She'll be like, don't ever say that again. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, think about it, it's liquid grace. It covers you. And you experience that victory. You come out of the water, you say, I am experiencing this new life, this new life. So as we get to the end of that chapter and all of a sudden the bottom of that choose your own ending book, it says, do you want to go to page 357 or go to page 324? Maybe this morning you're saying, you know what? If I'm going to choose my own ending this morning, I think I'm going to be baptized. And let me tell you, we have everything you need. I know the number one thing right now, everybody's going, well, I didn't bring clothes to be baptized. And Alex, I can't wear his clothes. I mean, that would be awkward. But we have everything you need. We have shirts. We have shorts. We have, we have underwear. We have deodorant. We have bags you can put your stuff in. Listen, uh, there, there are people this morning that, that they already know what they would need to do. At the end of this message, we didn't plan this. Like we said, yeah, we might... You know, um, but I just feel like the Holy Spirit's just, just saying, just offer, right? And, and so when we end, we'll, we'll take care of all of that. And you can be baptized today. And not, a, not because you have to, but because you want to. So as we close this service, I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we pray. <laughs> And then the band's going to just start playing this, this last song. And when they do, all I want you to do, if you want to be baptized this morning, is I want you just to simply walk out the back, okay? There's going to be people that, that are going to walk with you, and there's a, a room right off to the left. It's our first impressions room. Everything that you need is in there. We'll give you everything that you need. We'll make sure that you have a place to privately change and, uh, and then we'll have, we'll have people that will just instruct you to come up here to um, the, the baptism tank. We'll baptize you. Let me just tell you, you want to experience a celebration, this place will come unglued, okay? So we're going to pray together. When the band starts, you say, that's me. I know that we... You've heard me say this before, and some of you have said, well, I was baptized as a kid. Listen, I don't want to take away from that baptism. That's powerful. But if you know that you were baptized and you weren't able to make that choice, all this is is for your opportunity to say, I'm choosing today. It doesn't take away your baptism. It doesn't take away the power of that moment. It just says, I am making the choice today, not because I have to, but because I want to. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we honestly don't know. We don't know what the next few minutes hold. And, and Lord, it literally could be just us ending in celebration of worship. And how awesome would that be? It really, to be honest with you, doesn't matter how we end this service. If nobody steps up or steps forward to be baptized, or if everybody steps forward to be baptized, Lord, we are going to celebrate with you this morning because we believe in what you're doing among us. 
we are thankful for the transformational power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel that teaches us that we can't be, get clean on our own, that we are in need of a Savior, that we don't want to make this too difficult. We just want to call on your name to experience that salvation. We want to be able to say, Lord, I'm turning away from all the stuff of my past and my story and my life, and it's not what I'm turning away from that gets me more, it's so excited, it's what I'm, and who I'm turning to. Lord, that we turn to you this morning and that through baptism we can experience this wedding ring moment to say, I don't have to do this, but Lord, I want to do this. Give us the courage to be able to walk down that aisle of faith, to be able to step into the water and to say, I want to be clothed in your grace this morning. And Lord, I pray, I pray that you would make clear that this is not any sense of manipulation that this is not emotionalism, that this is literally just what your Holy Spirit and your Holy Spirit alone is speaking into each of us today. And so Jesus, we come to you now. We thank you for this powerful moment. And instead of waiting, we're going to say, let's do it now. We give you thanks and praise for this now in your name. Amen. Amen. As the band begins... If I see people starting to, so don't, so don't leave, okay? Because if, if I see you start to leave, I'm going to go get changed. Because I'm going to think you're going to go get baptized. So please, don't leave. But if, I, if we see people just starting to move out of the aisles, don't worry about the people around you. Don't worry, because guess what? They ain't standing in front of God when you go, okay? Just you, it's you and God. You just step out, go to the back. We're going to take care of you. And, uh, and if I see you go, I'm going to go get changed because we're going to do some baptisms, all right? All right? Let's go. The cross before me, the world behind me. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing. No turning back. I've been set free. Get out. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything Amen. I need. Christ, my all in all, and the joy of my salvation. Is this true? And this hope will never fail, for heaven is our home. Through every storm, my soul will sing, Jesus is here. God be the glory, Christ is enough for me, Christ is enough for me, everything I need is in you, everything I need. All right, now listen, now listen. We're going to go into the bridge of this song, and it simply says, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Now, I want to encourage you, let your hair down a little, including me, which that would be a task. And sing this, remembering the salvation that you have entered into in your story. Remembering that salvation moment. 
when you know that you gave your whole life to Christ and he covered you in that grace and you sing this out with that type of power and intensity, saying and declaring, I have decided to follow Jesus. And although the storms come, and although it gets hard, and although it doesn't always make sense, no turning back. No turning back. Right, church? Say it with me. No turning back. Let's sing it right out to him this morning. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So as we end our service, as we end all of our services together, we're going to do the benediction. And I encourage you just to open up your hands and to receive this today. And, uh, and, and, and can we again, just like we did last week, just kind of say this with the power and intensity that helps us to know that God is going to be with us and we desire for him to bless and keep us. So say this with me together, church. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen, you are sent.